Hello everybody, welcome to Boxing Science. In this video, I'm going to be covering a very important subject, not only for boxing performance, but for an athlete's health and well-being as well. Is being big for the weight a competitive advantage? Over the last year to 18 months, there's been a lot of debate around catch weights and rehydration clauses in the big fights. We've just had Javonta Davis and Ryan Garcia have a catch weight bout at 136 pounds draining Ryan Garcia down and then putting rehydration clothes on top of that as well. The competitive advantage was seen to be for Ryan Garcia because he had the size and reach advantage, but Javonta Davis got a seventh round KO. Javonta Davis is another example of a shorter fighter moving up the weights and still being successful based on strength, speed, but most importantly is boxing IQ and skill. And we've seen this in the past as well. Lomachenko, Manny Pacquiao, Floyd Mayweather, all short fighters not necessarily massive for the weight, but they've used the skill to be successful in multiple weight categories. So that leads me to the question, is being big for the weight a competitive advantage? Professional boxers try and cut down to the lowest weight possible to get a height and reach advantage to a certain point. But how much does this actually transfer to successful boxing performance? Using the data on BoxRec, we've looked at the height and reach of the top 20 boxers across eight weight divisions. With this data, we're looking whether athletes do have a competitive advantage. Does that correlate to their BoxRec ranking? How much it changes in between each weight division? And also looking at where the champions sit compared to the average of the top 20 boxers ranked on BoxRec. So the first correlation was height and reach with boxing weight divisions. And we can see there's a strong correlation, height and reach across eight different weight divisions. R squared value of 0.64 to 0.76, showing that there's strong correlation with height and reach. So as we go up higher in weight divisions, there's often an increase in height and reach. However, you can see with the dots on the graph here, this is quite spread across each weight division. There's some a lot lower than the average and some a lot higher. Let's see how the average compares to the number one ranked in the each weight division. This graph here is highlighting the average and the standard deviation and the ring magazine, I hope you like that icon there, represents the number one ranked boxer in each weight division. So we've got a range of different data here. There's five athletes that are actually sitting below the line for height advantage. Two that are really, really close to the line. There's one just a higher than Brandon Figueroa at super bantamweight. So mostly height does not have a transferred effect towards successful boxing performance. When you look at reach, there's more or less like four above the line. There's two massive outliers in Brandon Figueroa and Terence Crawford, which is really interesting, especially with Terence Crawford coming from lightweight through to welterweight. But then you've got four that are either on the line of the average or just below. There's no consistent findings in height and reach advantage in boxing. The number one box ranked fighter, number one in the world, isn't necessarily much higher than the average every single time. So this is showing that an athlete might not be wanting to just go on height and reach alone. With this, we know that these fighters, like there's some people that are ranked at number one, but this is debated in different governing bodies, obviously across the fan base as well. So let's have a look at the top 10 ranked with the top 11 to 20 ranked fighters. So looking at the top 10 fighters versus top 11 to 20 fighters, we see no consistent or significant findings. The dark blue line is 11 to 20 and the light blue line is ranked one to 10. You can see there that there's not that much difference. There's a little bit of difference at super middleweight, but this is actually top 11 to 20 compared to the top 10. No consistent or significant findings between competitive level. When we talk about correlation, does height and reach actually correlate with their box rec ranking. Looking at this data here, very, very scattered approach. So when we look at R squared values, we look at how strong the correlation is. We're looking at strong correlations are anywhere between 0.5 and 0.7. Really strong correlations, anything 0.7 and above. With this, there's 0.001 R squared value for a correlation between height and reach ratio with weight. There is zero correlation with height and reach for each weight category based on their box rec ranking. So this is showing, there's no real statistical evidence that's showing that height and reach has an advantage in boxing. You need the height and reach to suit your weight division. You don't want to be looking to drain a fighter 
just to have height and reach advantage alone. So with this in mind, we need to be considering a few different factors in selecting the right weight category for an athlete. And this is what we're gonna be covering now. At Boxing Science, we perform the Isaac Summer Skin Folds Test to test body composition. And there's two key factors that we use here to decide an athlete's weight category selection. The first one is body fat percentage. How low is an athlete's body fat? Using the Summer Skin Folds is a little bit higher percentage wise than you would get on a typical DEXA scan or a in-body assessment. The body fats that you're wanting to try and aim for is between 8 and 10% for a male athlete and 12 to 15% for a female athlete. However, this is very individualized. Some athletes can get a lot leaner, especially for female athletes as well. Some athletes are even higher than 15% in terms of like their hormone production and their menstrual cycle ability to perform at that weight category. If you go any lower than this body fat percentage, this can affect a lot of different things. It can put your body in a catabolic state, which can affect the return of muscle mass, hormone production. It can affect bone health, which can contribute to like hand and wrist injuries that we see a lot in boxing, and also can affect our thyroid function, which essentially is important, especially when we're working towards high intensities and then looking to make weight in the future. Another key factor from this body composition test is fat-free mass. So how much mass that you have that's free of fat. So that is lean muscle mass, bones, organs. We want the fat-free mass to be around the fighting weight. So if you fight at 57 kilos, which is featherweight, you're wanting your fat-free mass to be around about 57 kilos. So we know that we're not depleting an athlete too much getting towards that weight category. So fat-free mass is very, very important to choose. So if this is higher, so let's say this 57 kilo featherweight athlete, his fat-free mass is 59 or maybe even 60 kilos, we may be looking at losing some muscle mass, which will be impairing their performance, impairing the intensity performed within the training camp, might lead to some acute dehydration strategies as well. An athlete will probably look to try and dehydrate a lot more to get towards their weight category if their fat-free mass is higher than their weight category target. Another important factor is how an athlete responds to acute weight-making strategies, such as a low-residue diet and also like dehydration strategies. So if you've got an athlete that can sweat more, has a higher sweat rate and can tolerate being under heat stress, they might be able to do the higher end of the recommended dehydration targets, which is between three and 5%. However, we've had athletes before that might not be able to withstand that sweat rate and might not be able to tolerate that heat stress. So they may be more suited to 3% or under weight cut. So when considering weight category selection, you've got to think about your athlete and what weight they best perform at whether that's in the gym, s &C, and their scores that they're hitting on the kind of movement jump high or a trap bar deadlift or on the curve of the treadmill and then how they're performing in sparring. So if they've got an athlete that's sparring best around about 10 stone, that's what weight that they need to be refueling to and performing at in the ring. If they're not refueling to that, they're getting a competitive disadvantage by going into the ring. So let's say we take that 10 stone athlete and they're having now to make super bantam weight which is 8 stone 10 they can only refuel up to I don't know 9 stone 6 they're well below their competition level of what they best perform at so really with that athlete there they might need to move up in weight category to make sure that they're refueling high enough to hit their performance weight this is something that we've seen quite often in boxing science that when they're getting into the ring they're a lot lighter than what they best perform at in the gym, in their SNC, but also the perceived performance during sparring. Another factor is like deciding on how they perform best against heavier boxers. So let's say you've got somebody that's going down to featherweight, but they're performing well against lightweights in sparring. Obviously, there's a lot of difference when you're putting the eight ounce gloves on when you get into the ring, but if they seem strong enough to be sparring and competing well against lightweights and can deal with the strength and the punch power of lightweights, they're going to be, have competitive advantage going into a higher weight class. So they're the different performance factors to consider when selecting 
a weight category for boxing. Then finally, looking at more technical thing is the resting metabolic rate to weight ratio. An athlete's resting metabolic rate, so RMR, is how much calories an athlete is expending if they're totally resting. So if they were in bed all day, they'd be burning between 1,600 to 2,000 calories per day. Then obviously you have your active calories on top of that. If an athlete is hitting lower than what their expected RMR is, so anywhere between 400 to 500 calories, this can really affect their weight making process. So this makes the camp a lot tougher, but also it's an indicator that the body is not in a fit state to be doing performance diet. Being at higher weight class might help boost that metabolic rate and be able to diet better and perform better within training camp. So this is something that we really highlight at Boxing Science to do and perform with our athletes, getting their resting metabolic rate. So not only to make a more structured and accurate diet plan, to make sure that we're making weight safely and effectively, but also to highlight whether an athlete should be at the right weight category. So that's the end of the video where we've reviewed whether it is benefit to be bigger at the weight, benefits to being bigger at the weight, having size and reach advantage, and you need to select the right weight category that's for you. But this shouldn't be selected on height and reach alone and trying to get down to the lowest weight category possible where you're getting a physical advantage. You want to be selecting performance targets. You want to be doing your body composition tests, looking at your body fat percentage and looking at your fat free mass to make sure that you're making weight safely and effectively. But most importantly, you've got your right performance weight, weight that's going to be more suited to you to optimize your potential. Thank you very much for watching. If you've got any questions about the subjects that we've covered or the data that we've covered in this video, please leave them in the comment box below. And if you're wanting to find out more about our training methods, Boxing Science website, boxingscience.co.uk. We've got a range of different products and services from eBooks to more bespoke one-to-one -one services in strength and conditioning and in nutrition to help unlock your potential. Thank you very much for watching. See you on the next video of Boxing Science.